let me just remind you, you of course know all this, but let me just remind you that this is the five stages of the crisis. The first three were kind of Western world, most of it. The last two are European or Euro area crisis mostly. So that's just, and, and it shows this way in the level of the GDP. But that's just the background. Let me, uh, I received the paper only on Sunday evening and, and being, being a civil servant, unfortunately yesterday and today have been rather busy. So I wrote, wrote a set of notes before receiving the, the slides. And so what I did, I, let me just go run through my slides first. And, but then I did receive it. And I spent, uh, you know, work fairly late on Sunday and a little, bit to, a little bit yesterday. And I have a critique of the slides. So I'll get back to that in the, in the second half. Anyway, let me just start by saying, uh, it was already said, I was an academic until uh, seven years ago. About seven years ago, I joined the Central Bank. And last position was in, in University of Cambridge. My main, my main research area has been what you would be calling outside the mainstream. I have, I have faced strong criticisms. I've faced these problems sometimes with journal publication, so forth. That has always happened to me, but it's not heterodox, I can tell you. So there's, it, the alternatives are not mainstream heterodox. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's something else. I also have some, some mainstream economic research. Uh, and and so, here, so, this is, so my views without before responding to the representation. Yes, the crisis was not foresee sufficiently foreseen by the economists. Of course, the demand which sort of came up in the presentation saying that you have to, was not able to predict the crisis. Well, I'm not quite sure what the word predict means, but if you mean that predict cri timing of the crisis, that I think is not. Uh, if, but there were, there were people who, and by the way, the first that I know is Raghu Rajan, 2005 in Jackson Hole in the Central Bankers meeting. Notice that this is before the heterodox list of names that was cited later. I quoted him in the paper. <laughs> but anyway, Raj, Raj, he of course is a mainstream economist. Yeah. Uh, but also, also, you know, it is, you know, it definitely is a problem. And quite right, the speaker uh, that financial fragility and crisis was in uh, not in the economics curriculum of many universities. When I was an academic, I saw a number of them and that was a problem, but some universities covered the subject. In fact, I did, since, uh, since uh, I started teaching monetary banking and monetary policy in Cambridge. About a third of the course was about financial fragility and crisis. So the claim that it is not nowhere is, is a matter of the department, not, not the subject necessarily. Obviously, I, I also agree that economic history should play a much, more, much bigger role in this. I mean, the, you know, the institutions, I mean also institutions, and this is, this is something which has happened in the, in the subject, and also history of economic thought. It used to be in the curricula, for some reason it has been dropped, and it obviously should be back there. That, those, so those are, there I'm, I'm basically in agreement. The, you know, uh, in the, the crisis obviously was, really two areas of economics were greatly affected by the crisis. One was finance especially efficient markets theory. The idea that somehow the markets work well are something called informationally efficient. There are other versions of the theory that obviously uh, was, was, was receiving much criticism as, as we've seen. Clearly there were inefficiencies came, came to being. Uh, but you have to also remember that finance has other things. It's not just efficient markets theory. Uh, there's a great deal of emphasis on, on consequences of asymmetric information, moral hazard, etc., effects on, on financial institution banking, and so forth. These are objects of research, and that they, they have produced, uh, you know, produced some. Uh, no, maybe I should not use the word useful, but some interesting work, which is suggesting good empirical phenomena as well. There is behavioral finance, high volatility stuff, so forth, uh, which uh, which are. Are there. So that's, you know, finance is a big field, a number of different things. The efficient markets theory, obviously, uh, you know, they, they were believers on that, and that, I think, was dealt with a big, big blow uh, in this. Macroeconomics, obviously, was the other one, other one here. And there were two, uh, two uh, different problems in the, in the mainstream of what I would call a rational equitation approach. One was, of course, that there was far too little or hardly any emphasis on financial markets or financial market imperfections. Uh, and, and so that's one. 
The other one, of course, was that the assumption of rational equitations uh, downplayed the role of imperfect information and knowledge that should be there in, 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 in macroeconomics. And, and in particular, the, the role can be critical in, in, in not in necessarily in the long run, because the long run obviously is in, in, in many ways unpredictable. We don't quite know, but, because, but the, if you're saying that nothing, not, no further surprising developments happen, then the question is, what is how, do, how do you look at the long run? That, that's another, maybe, maybe people learn over time. Maybe people learn over time. But it obviously in the dynamic response, in particular during things where you have big changes like in the, in the financial crisis and the recession, there the imperfect knowledge problem is, is particularly severe. So uh, some developments in, in macroeconomics, of course, is that we've seen now, uh, you know, also in the mainstream response, where financial market imperfections play a big role in this. That has happened. Also, you know, the new issue is about the very low interest rates or zero interest rates, and what else one might want to call. What about that for, for macroeconomic analysis, analysis of macroeconomic policies and so forth? So that, that is new. That is a response to the crisis in part. part uh, you know, for example, the latter one I've worked I've worked on the latter subject. I started it before the current crisis, but as a response to some earlier work on Japan. Uh, and and Japanese, Japan has had the zero interest rate problem since, since the 1990s already. There are also you know, analytical and alternatives to mainstream rational expectations macroeconomics. Uh, uh, let me just mention a few expectations for me. This imperfect knowledge informa information problems uh, lead, lead, has led to various kinds of responses. I worked on learning. There's also costly information, at the, uh, something called rational intention, inattention, using statistical decision theory ideas in, in modeling, modeling rationality, so forth. There's much more focus on bounded rationality, behavioral macro, even experimental work. You might some find that surprising, but that can also be done. You can, that can teach us some basic things about economic behavior, even, even macroeconomics. And of course, there's greatly increased input, emphasis on empirical research. The other schools of thought, the heter so-called heterodox schools of thought, also exist, of course. Evolutionary economics, Austrian, etc. But let me not say anything more about that. So, so I clearly, you know, the uh, I'm I'm not no longer an economics teacher, but I do do want to say that a better knowledge or an understanding of history and institutions is obviously one of the. Uh, uh, areas where you need a major improvement in economic, economic teaching. Also, uh, the history of economic thought and different schools of thought need some emphasis and a much greater focus on empirical research. We have better data sets than ever, and, and yet, yet economics uh, uh, is still too little emphasis on, re you know, it, has, it is changing, there is more empirical work, but the response to these new data sets has been slow and that should be that should be added but let me also saying that say that you know if you study economics you have to re realize that you are you are studying a very much moving object it's not about selecting one's philosophy of life uh, research moves forward like any other any other field or discipline and this must happen in broad and flexible ways so i that i think is important here and the success is measured not by prediction it's measured by empirical empirical and theoretical explanation of these things. So let me now move on to the, uh, to the presentation uh, and comment. Uh, as I've, you've already noticed from my own remarks and my own assessments, I'm in broad agreement about the misplaced emphasis in economics curriculum. However, I'm, I'm fairly critical of what, what's being suggested here. The big problem I have in the presentation, the really big problem is that it doesn't describe mainstream economics fairly or well at all. No, it describes a straw man. Let me use one Finnish word, olkimies. Simple uh, straw man, and that's very misleading. You know, is this lack of knowledge? I'm sure it's not, but is it, it is a matter of emphasis or, or maybe even something more. Let me just pick a few examples from the slides where, where just to show you that these things are just wrong. Here's a quote from a slide. Society, institutions, social norms have no role in such an analysis, talking about the mainstream. Well, what about models of collective bargaining? What about inside 
you know, I can pick many examples, many papers, large number of papers in these subjects. In, for example, labor markets insider-outsider theory. That's a matter of, of, of different classes in the labor market, so forth. Mm -hmm. There was some mainstream analysis by Lynn Beckett Stover, for example, and, and it, it obviously has that. Yeah. Here's another quote. Policymakers st should strive to replicate what be, would have prevailed under optimal setting. This, of course, is talking about the, about the theory of economic policy, I should say. But that's two missing. One is, of course, that optimal policy corresponding to equilibrium optimality setting only in the strawman version, in very simple, simple versions of the mainstream. In more complex models, you have trade-offs. You can't achieve the first best, so to speak. You have trade-offs. And, of course, the practice is very different. The central banks have taken a very pragmatic response to the financial crisis, and reality is much different. Let me just skip the slide 11 about the hot economics. Again, the same story that there are these, uh, the, you know, that the, the misrepresentation of, of, of the mainstream is bad. Let me pick another one, which is more extreme. The mainstream has no significance of debt relations, no asset bubble, price bubbles, etc. What about, for example, Jean Tirol, this year's Nobel laureate, published in 1982 a paper about, about speculative bubbles using a mainstream tool. Of course, it wasn't the straw man version. It was something called the overlapping generations model, infinity of finitely lived agents, infinity of markets, but it also meant that markets are incomplete. He nevertheless he used the standard equilibrium notions and, and got bubbles out of it. I, I agree very much with about the financial I would also put it more strongly, there's also fraud. You know, the, just the LIBOR, the interest rate manipulation, exchange rate manipulation, which the banks are now paying fines on. The other, other ones, let me just, just keep because of the time. I already said about Rajan and the other heterodox things, so I don't really have to say. The other one about this, uh, you know, this is something where I would say that, of course, you have to read uh, Marx, Minsky, etc. I did. Many read these during my study times. I also read the old post Keynesians at the time in the 1970s when I, when I was a student. But the point is that you don't stop there. For example, Marx's labor theory of value relies on a very extreme assumption to be valid, one which surely doesn't hold in reality. So notice that I'm using the realisticness of assumptions as my critique of Marx. Second, Minsky, yes, he made a fine point, That's but it was terrible. just the point. It's a starting point. There's one, one you know, for, let's go and do some further research. There's a recent paper by Eckertsen and Krugman a couple of years ago about, use, about the Minsky points. It's the worst paper you can read ever. Then, ever. then about the pluralism and so forth. I don't know what the Bank of England people say, were saying. I, of course, uh, you know, I'm you know, being a researcher myself, or having been a researcher myself, I'm ready to admit that ongoing research, sometimes it has some successes, it always faces a large number of problems, unsolved problems, difficulties which you try to solve. And so, so that's the, one has to be modest on, on this in, in economics like in any other discipline. There are, you know, let's go forward, let's try to solve these problems. And, and the trouble is that this straw man uh, presentation of mainstream economics, it doesn't prove anything we need an honest assessment and one which emphasizes the empirical results a great deal. What about the central banks? Uh, uh, yeah, we of course, we, we use the mainstream models, not the straw man versions, but somewhat, somewhat better models. And they may be, may be uh, uh, that, you know, they may be, may be the, the problematic, but they also provide some, some good ideas and maybe some, some, some things also at least partly right. Andy Haldane, uh, Haldane's statement, which was, was on there, I, I know Andy fairly well. The trouble is that he, that was a very ge general statement. It, again, he doesn't, you know, it doesn't take uh, account of ongoing developments. Andy, of course, knows these very well. And, and so I'm basically in agreement with him. Borio, again, you know, another other one who, whom I, I every now and then have co contact with, he's a fine scholar. But, but really, he's not the en innovator of endogenous cycles. There was a whole bu bunch of theory, including mainstream theory. Carl Schell, David Cass, Jean-Michel Grandmont. They developed this. Again, the key is the, is the idea that markets are somehow not complete. There are things which you don't have markets. 
That's the starting point. So really, I would want to, uh, I, while I've, I've already said that I, you know, the economics teaching has to change, in my, in my opinion, and so forth, but I would actually put a bigger challenge to heterodox economics, which is that let's go and do serious research about it, in particular empirical research, and, and, and let's see that the, if, is that performance good empirically, and does it produce, you know, does it add to it? I'm sure it will. I'm sure there'll be, there'll be good uh, research on alternative ones which will contribute positively to understanding some of the problems that we have in a, in a, and, and help, help, help with those. But do it, just go and do it, and do it with models that do not use very narrow and unrealistic assumptions. I, have, I put a great deal of emphasis on reasonable, reasonably realism of, the, of assumptions. The Friedman stuff is, is long gone, I think, in, in economics, at least in my view. And then final slide. The slide that, that was shown last in the presentation is, is an important point. The fact that you know, the, there are these attempts to have a political influence on social sciences, including economics, and that is a serious concern. Because if, you know, if it becomes very intertwined with politics, then, then that, that can lead to big, big problems. Of course, these attempts come from conservatives, but not only from there. They can come from elsewhere, including the left wing, but also not just left wing and conservatives, maybe other, other areas too. And I'm, I'm sorry that to say that history is full of examples about these harmful influences from politics. They really do hamper progress in this, and, and sort of genuine intellectual progress where you try to strive for better empirical and theoretical explanation of, of economic phenomena. And students, uh, they, you know, it has been a valuable contribution, this movement of the students. But, uh, you know, maybe I have the perspective now, which I didn't have in the 1970s when I was student, uh, a student, uh, but this is where you can also be at risk. You know, sometimes the political influence is kind of uh, not, uh, not very visible and can, be, can lead to some bad outcomes, which students of the 1970s, I think, can testify. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, maybe now would you first want to comment your comments? Comment on my comments. <laughs> yeah. And then we will go to the panel discussion. Well, I'll say a few things basically about, about these. Now, we're about the Strowman representation. First of all, the students get the student Strowman representation. That's, that's what they get, and that's why they're complaining. And second, it's not exactly the Strowman representation. My main criticism against the mainstream is the methodology. And there's not been a single word said on methodology. Dr. Onkopoya said the model should have realistic assumptions. Then that applies first and foremost to the mainstream, actually, before the heterodox representative agents, representative firms, imaginary equilibriums, like absolutely no back, no justification for the existence of an equilibrium, even. And as I've said, uh, I've already conceded this, that a lot of the mainstream literature takes the basic wrong foundation and adds realisticness on top of that. Sure. Adds, adds realisticness on top of that. So yes, I, I am aware of a lot of models which are more realistic than the basic Stroman model. Yes, they are more realistic, like they have some, some auxiliary hypothesis. That's why I talked about auxiliary hypothesis there. That the Strowman version is what the students get straight away. And one other problem is that, as I've said, the methodology is what is wrong here. It's taking individual agents, equilibriums, convergence to equilibriums, all these imaginary concepts. This is what's wrong. And it is possible to get bubble. Is it possible to get bubbles out of a mainstream model? Yes. Of course it is. As you know, there are many of them. By the way, that Krugman paper is the worst paper on Minsky that one can ever read, basically. And it's been 
it's been actually criticized extremely heavily anyway by post Keynesians because it is a horrible model to say the least and it's a mainstream model once again and the reason I said that debt relations I want to particularly talk about debt relations why I said that debt relations do not play any significant role this basically comes from the belief that as I've said somebody's debt is somebody else's savings which is entirely wrong this is not how the banking system works. Those of you familiar with the banking system will know this, that banks do not transfer, transfer people's savings to investors. That's not how the banking system works. That's a myth, actually. Banks create money when they land and they create money at will. This has been conceded by papers by Bank of England once again. If you don't believe me, Read the 2014 Bank of England papers, which says exactly these, these sentences. Banks create money out of thin air. So banks are not intermediaries. They're not, yeah, they're not channeling somebody's savings to, to some investment. That's exactly why I said there is no debt relationship. Because for a mainstream economist, debt relationship means when there's debt, there's somebody else's saving on the other side. So that borrowed money comes from savings, actually. This is, this is the basic of all of it. And once again, as I've said, the straw man, what, what happens with the more sophisticated mainstream models, which I've read a lot of them as well, they take the straw man version, which is, again, representative agents or equilibrium representative firms. Sometimes they'll add auxiliary hypotheses on top of that, which are realistic, as you have said. They will be realistic. They'll add frictions on it and say there's market imperfection, for example. And they're going to say they're going to add some other realistic assumptions on top of the basic wrong model, the, base, the basic edifice. But as I've said, what is problematic is the entire methodology that is wrong. That assuming that we analyze crisis, especially by results of shocks, there is some shock that hits an economy that creates the crisis. All this methodology, all this fetish with equilibrium, that economies move to equilibrium. And there's one nice blog post written by Roger Farmer from University of California at LA, actually. And there he was talking about why economists, mainstream economists, are so, are so let's say, fond of equilibrium analysis. And I've spoken about this endless times with a lot of mainstream economists. Why is this equilibrium fetish? Now, there are two reasons. One is that economists don't know the mathematics to handle this equilibrium. And you're going to need some really, really serious mathematics if you want to handle this equilibrium stuff. It needs a very high level of mathematics that economists do not know. That's one of the reasons. Equilibrium is easy to solve. It's pretty easy to solve equilibrium stuff. And the second one, as Roger Farmer himself argues, that at, at least the reason he himself gives for all this equilibrium fetish, is that at some point he attended a 1980 conference and one economist convinced everyone inside that uh, there's not enough data to conduct this equilibrium analysis, so it comes out of a necessity that we cannot conduct this equilibrium analysis because we don't have data. But as I've said, my main criticism is not about the realisticness. It is easy to add realistic assumptions on top of a wrong, wrong edifice. That is possible. You can try to make it as realistic as you want. The problem is that the whole mechanism of starting from the individual, ignoring the, the, the relationships with, of the individual with the society, and assuming that you can actually arrive at... I mean, Varoufakis gives the example of a watchmaker, for example, and he argues that... A watchmaker takes a watch, opens the watch, takes out all the pieces one by one, analyzes each piece, and then understands how the watch work, that wo works. Then he puts all the watch together once again, one by one, piece by piece, and it makes a watch. And this is kind of the, the idea that mainstream economics has, that if you start from firms, individuals, and if you start adding them up, you're going to come up at, this, at, at the appropriate results for the society. But unfortunately, this view has been criticized very heavily by other social scientists, that the society is not really the sum of its parts. It's not, that is not how the society works. We are not watchmakers. This is not some simple, simple mechanical business that we are going to take individuals, we are going to add them up, and then we are going to arrive at, at, at the results, actually. So my main criticism, as always, was at the at the methodology of it. When I talked about debt, particularly I want to talk about that, that's exactly why I talked about debt relationships. And 
I agree maybe that I, I should have made it more clear that more sophisticated mo mainstream models are not as, as like the Strowman version that I have mentioned here. But, and that is true, I completely agree with that. I've read more complicated mainstream models, plenty of them, which try to make it realistic and all that. But in terms of economics teaching, first of all, that's what the students get. Uh, they get the Strawman version, and second, the policy conclusions are given from the Paul Strawman versions straight away. You have said that central banks are, ap apply different policies in practice. Practice is different. I completely agree. That's because the central banks are not listening to the mainstream, really. That's why, because the mainstream cannot uh, provide any responses, any answers to their problems, so they improvise. As you've said, I agree with you, they improvised after the crisis completely because there was no, nothing, no tool really from the mainstream to help them. And so that, that's what I want to say. As I've said, my main, main problem with the, with the mainstream economics is with its methodology and with all this individualistic, methodological individualism and equilibrium and, and all this setup is problematic. All this exogenous shock setup is what is problematic and this is masking this sort of analysis is actually masking the real problems that we need to analyze within this system. There are bigger problems within the system that needs to be analyzed. And this sort of analysis is making it impossible to analyze it within this framework. That's my main, main criticism and that's all I'm going to say. And I'll Thank keep you. it here. Now you can stay. <laughs>